But let's move on now and talk specifically about one of the myeloclyptive neoplasms, and that's polycythemia vera. And we're going to start with making the diagnosis. So, Serge, how do these patients typically present? What are their signs and symptoms? And what should be part of the initial evaluation of these patients? So polycythemia vera, as the name implies, means that all the cells are growing without control. But we are talking really about erythrocytosis. This is the uh, underlying uh, unique feature of this particular MPN, and it's present in uh, everybody, provided there is enough iron there. We already said that some patients don't have an extraordinary higher erythrocytosis because they already have iron deficiency at presentation. And because of too many cells in a, in a blood circulation, and about half of the patients, or 40 to 60 percent, would have high white cells and high platelets. You have too many cells, the circulation is impaired, so you have a, a multitude of symptoms from fatigue, blurred vision, headaches, shortness of breath. Then you have a skin involvement with some itching in the skin, sensitivity of the, of the skin. You have these uh, uh, systemic symptoms from impaired circulation. You can also have abdominal symptoms from enlarged spleen. It is something that people develop slowly over time and leads them to a doctor to complain where they are found to have abnormal blood cell count on the regular CBC. The other way around is because this disease comes with the increased risk of thrombosis, and we'll talk about it. A uh, number of patients present, even at this time and age, with a, an event. I mean, they present with the clotting event up front, undiagnosed, and they are diagnosed at the time of having that uh, event, they're hospitalized for a clot in the leg or the lungs, and then they are recognized to have actually a blood disorder that predisposes to uh, the clot. That may be 25 to 30 percent of the patients still presenting with the event itself. And that is actually the major issue with this particular disease. Impaired circulation, increased risk of thrombosis, and the therapies that we have and prognostication that we have um, in place is all aimed to address the thrombotic risk that comes with the disease. So in terms of the uh, risk assessment, once we are done with the diagnostic process, the diagnostic process would have the erythrocytosis. We would test in blood or in bone marrow, but blood is equal to a bone marrow for the JAK2V617F mutation. We would look at the bone marrow biopsy to see panmyelosis with increased uh, erythrocytes and the granulocytes. So the bone marrow would be there, the JAK2 mutation, the uh, high hemoglobin hematocrit, you can also look at erythropoietin in blood, which is one of the minor criteria, where it would be low because the bone marrow does not need to produce it anymore. That's a growth factor for the red blood cells. So putting this uh, diagnostic criteria together, you are now confident to have a PV. The next question is, what I mentioned already, what is the thrombotic risk? And traditionally, we have two factors that would determine uh, how we act toward that PV patient. That's a 60 years of age or older, or a history of blood clotting. And if you have one or the other, you are a PV patient with a high risk of blood clotting. If you are none of the two, then you are a low risk for the blood clotting. There are some other factors we can talk about and we should, like a white blood cell count. Uh, maybe there is a role for monitoring white cell count a little bit more cautiously. But two factors, age and the history of thrombosis, would divide the patients into uh, groups. And if you are low risk, phlebotomy and baby aspirin. If you are high risk, phlebotomy, baby aspirin, and you start cytoreductive therapy to decrease or normalize, if you will, the blood cell count, eliminate need for phlebotomy, and maintain patients at the low levels all the time without the spikes to decrease the thrombotic risk. Okay, so let me, let me challenge some of these things. So in the new WHO criteria for diagnosing PV, the threshold for the diagnosis has been lowered to a hemoglobin of 16 and a half for men, 16 for women, okay? to pick up on this mass polycythemia vera. But will a clinician out there be at risk if they have a patient who runs a normally high hemoglobin and they don't do a bone marrow and they don't do a JAK2? I mean, how do you decide who you're gonna do that evaluation on? Is it everyone or the ones who have the symptoms? This is a really important question and it extends into the, uh, the other uh, side of the coin is, is uh, all these workups absolutely necessary it's, if it's obvious that it's PV. So in cases when, where you would have a high normal uh, hemoglobin of hematocrit, as you properly said, the threshold for diagnosis has been lowered to normal levels. It would be 16 for females, 16.5 for men. Why not then test anybody who is above those numbers? But you have to have a suspicion for polycythemia vera. That is the clinician's input here. Otherwise, anybody can do it just based on the numbers. So you have to have a symptoms. 
you may have a high vitals or high platelets, you may have a low MCV, which would uh, probably suggest iron deficiency. There must be something else than the number of uh, red blood cells, hemoglobin and hematocrit of 17, for example, then everybody would be testing for PV. That is expensive and unnecessary. There needs to be a clinical suspicion. On the other hand, to switch the coin, if you have uh, obvious erythrocytosis of hematocrit of 20, and you have jacto mutation on blood, you have a low erythropoietin and low MCV with iron deficiency, why do you need the bone marrow? You probably don't.